Now, we've talked about what the purposes are and the various things that are the cause of the creation of the so-called doctrines and the purpose. Now what we have to look at is how to help the average human being to realize that purpose. The purpose of a Zen monastery, or temple for that matter, is to teach everyone how to get to this third position and teach in every sense of the term by means of visual aids, meditation, sound, anything that will help a person to get to that state is legal to use, so long as it does not break the precepts. Mm -hmm. Nothing that breaks the precepts can be used. For this reason, the meditation hall in a Zen temple is extremely plain, very, very simple. The ceremony hall is very gorgeous because the ceremony hall has to represent the glory of being one with the eternal or in the third position. Therefore, it always drips with gold brocade and candles and uh, incense. It represents, if you like to use the term, heaven. Whereas the meditation hall represents the person here on earth struggling to get from where he is to the eternal to the third position, which is where he would be. The ceremonial that takes place every day of the week, the morning ceremony, as I've explained many times to these classes, is a recital of how to get from where one is to the third position. The first scripture explains to you how important faith is, faith that the third position exists, and that you have a Buddha nature and that you can actually make it. Faith is the first thing. Having the belief in yourself that you can do it. The second scripture tells you what sort of changes are going to occur in you so that you know what clues to look for to see that you're going in the right direction. The third one tells you of all the different pitfalls that come up. Don't get too close because this has happened. Don't get too far away because it's happened. Don't be frightened by this. Don't be too encouraged by that. Just keep going quietly. And so it goes along. Then, if you understand all of that, the next part of the ceremony is giving thanks to the people called the uh, ancestors, those who have actually made it to the third position and have been able to pass on the information as to how to get there. That completes the ceremony that takes place in the meditation hall, the very plain area. You then walk into, you process into the ceremony hall because having done it right, you are now one with the eternal. And now is the time to see what the reward is going to look like. So you make it to the ceremony hall with all its gold and glory and recite the scripture of great wisdom, which explains that none of this belongs to you as personal thing. And yet, as I explained to you earlier, the dragging of your hand through the water. Everyone can enjoy the water, but no one can own the water. It belongs to everyone. This is what comes of doing it the right way. Now, there's one gentleman earlier 
people who said, well, what happens about, uh, shouldn't we have something, so to speak, for the sake of society so that uh, they won't be, uh, people won't get to the state when they don't care what they do because there's no consequence. That is one of the most serious and dangerous of Buddhist heresies. Because it means that you are actually completely and totally irresponsible. And a Buddhist is an extremely responsible person because the one thing he knows is that the consequences of his own wrong actions are going to be visited on other people. And he is therefore not only <coughs> keeping himself away from the eternal, but he is also causing others to turn away. Buddhism, unlike Taoism and certain other religions, does not frighten people with the hells. In ancient times in India, the nearest they got to it, as I said someone here just now, was to have a tariff board which said, if you lie, you will be reborn with bad breath. <laughs> if you constantly fornicate, you will be reborn female. Those are the two I remember. <laughs> um, having been something of an exaggerator in my youth and not being able to do anything about the second one, uh, they naturally uh, came over rather loud and clear. But it didn't work any more than yelling hell fire at the average small boy has any effect. I can remember when I was young, the people in my hometown, which was, uh, well, I come from a county in England, which is the equivalent of California, which meant that it had a lot of very rich and very curious people in it in some respects, most of them interested in a lot of things that they would have been better they weren't interested in. One of which was a very famous sorcerer. And you did not threaten your children by the bogeyman or the devil. You threatened them by Alistair Crowley, who lived two rows two ro <laughs> down from me. And it worked. <laughs> you could see him walking about, and he was alive. That worked. It worked a lot better than the devil ever did. The devil was something that they just yelled about in church. But Alistair Crowley really looked the part. He was just around the corner. <laughs> if you're going to do this sort of thing, you've got to have something to back it up with. And a nebulous devil just doesn't do it. Now, the Taoists definitely did a better job in that, in their temples, they always had what I call a chamber of horrors, which was a bunch of small caves, inside each of which was some poor creature, a statue of it, of course, being tortured in some ghastly way. Liars were having their tongues wrenched out. Uh, fornicators were having their parts removed. Um, but so it went on like this, and there was a hellhound, usually with one horn. Buddhist demons have one horn. They don't have two. It's always in the place where the third eye is. And they were just torturing them quietly, and the Buddha sat there watching, feeling terribly sorry for them. And if you got up to things you shouldn't do, you just had to spend a night in the Chamber of Horrors. And I gather it worked rather well on the Chinese. I mean, having to spend a night, imagine having a, waking up with a start and finding that beside you. I mean, there were dozens of these things. They were really ghastly. And anybody who goes to um, Singapore, Hong Kong, can see these chambers of horrors in the Tiger Balm Gardens. They were built for the job. So this system was used, but Buddhism does not use it. And it doesn't use it for a very interesting reason. There's a... I've often explained to people that if you want to really learn Buddhism, you've got to be positive and not negative. 
You cannot say, oh, I've drunk half my beer. You've got to say, half my beer is left. There must not be the fear that I'm losing something, I've got nothing, the negativity of fear. Yes, we could control people, I don't doubt if we wanted to, by having some sort of hell and terror and all the rest of it. It's been tried and it's worked in the past. But the Buddhist instead prefers to tell you what heaven is like, rather than telling you what hell is. And this comes directly out of an actual teaching of the Buddha himself. One young monk came to him. It is said, I, I cannot vouch for the story other than it is in the actual scriptures. The young monk came to him and said how much he wanted to be a monk, but he was terribly in love with a beautiful girl. And it is said the Buddha reached up into heaven and brought down a heavenly maiden and said, yeah, well, take a look at the one you've got and then take a look at this one. <laughs> Which do you prefer? And the young man immediately decided that he preferred the heavenly one to the one he was seeing. And uh, the monks, I gather, ribbed him quite a bit over this. And in the end, he realized he'd, made a very un he'd done a very unworthy thing and trained for the sake of training. But that is always how Buddhism has done it. It has always shown you that which is better, rather than terrifying you with demons and hell. And that is precisely what goes on in the actual teaching when you are training people or teaching people in the congregation and in the... Uh, in the monastery. You tell them how to get there, then you show them how gorgeous it's going to be by making the most gorgeous place you can think of possible when they've made it. And you recite the same set of scriptures day after day after day so that when the moment comes, it's just second nature for you to make the right decision. Almost the, the words that you need for each situation sort of comes almost like writing in front of your eyes. Don't come too close. Don't get too far away. Don't do this. Do that. And the right decisions are made because it happens every day of the week. And it's finally part of your blood and bones. You've got it into your mind as to how to do it. And you've also got the scripture that tells you how the changes are taking place. So you've got all your clues and then this gorgeous room that shows you what it's going to be like when you've made it. And I can tell you that when you find the third position, the hondo is just a pale little shadow of what it's like. So they are trying to do the finest job possible, but there is no way that a human being can paint that picture. And it's important to know that. So that's the first reason for all the decorativeness and for beauty, and some find it horrifying that they'll know you should be much colder and much more, uh, what's the word, austere. Yes, that's a good word for it, much more austere than that. But by doing it this way, you encourage people to want the right thing. There is nothing wrong with desiring the eternal. It's dangerous to think that all desire is wrong. Most desire is wrong. But when you desire the eternal, you're going in the right direction. There is own desire is only wrong when a selfish ego, an egocentric self, is in the is in the ascendancy. To long to be one with God is a darn good thing to long for. There's nothing wrong with that. So, that is the purpose of morning service. Evening service is a recitation of how to do meditation. And yes, it gets boring because it's the same thing every day. And one day you'll be sitting there and something goes boing and you head, my God, that's one of the things I haven't been doing. 
because you can never remember to do everything at the very beginning. And only by the constant repetition does it eventually get to be doing it in every single way, every part of it. So that's the second one. In the evening, there is another bunch, it's late in the evening before bedtime, there is another bunch of things. There are two things you can recite at that time. One is the rules for training, which is one that is done with uh, in some temples in the Far East, and the other is a collection of small, um, what they call gatas, which is loosely translated as hymns in this country, but really that doesn't doesn't bring it over properly. They are small things that really help one's faith. And it's the final one, which is peace upon the pillow, the golden bell that rings but once brings peace upon the pillow, is representative of what will happen when one finally becomes one for eternity with the third position, which is at the time of death if you've cleaned up the perfect. Makura Om. The Om is all that a lot of people know of it, but the full thing is Makura Om. Peace upon the pillow, the golden bell that rings but once. The call that will come. And so the morning, evening, and night ceremonies, and I've quite bluntly called the last one Vespers, and there's nothing wrong with the word, even if it does have some Christian connotation. It's a darn good word for the prayers that you do at the last, the last thing of the day. These three train you day in, day out, until they are part of you. And gradually, all these things happen as you sit in meditation. And you do, indeed, find the third position. Now, the second thing that I have to point out on this is why it is essential to do this sort of training, either as a layman, and there's nothing wrong with being a layman, or as a monk, and there's nothing wrong with being a monk. They're just going by slightly different routes, but they both end up in the same place. The monk gets there, we hope, somewhat quicker, because he is doing it full time, but there's uh, no guarantee of anything in, uh, in any occupation. I've known a lot of amateur musicians that were a darn sight better than a lot of the professional ones, is what I'm saying on this. But on the whole, it should be that the monk has a better opportunity because he's at it full time. In doing this type of training, a monk or a layman is actually preparing for the moment of death, which is only a position in time as is birth, so that at the moment of death, the wrong mistakes, well, mistakes are always wrong, the wrong things, the wrong actions, the wrong decisions can be taken if this training is not clear. And if you have done a bunch of, shall we say, runs beforehand of finding the third position before death actually occurs, then you are not nearly as likely to make mistakes when death comes as if you didn't know where to go. Therefore, it is said that the ability to die while sitting and standing which transcends both peasant and trade, is achieved by the power of meditation. You have learned how to stay alive or to just walk away if the illness is too heavy in the meditation, and you do not have to suffer in the same way. My own, the, my own ordination master, who was dying of cancer, they just operated on him, and they were doing everything they could to keep him alive. And he realized it was absolutely useless, sat up in bed, 
died and there was nothing they could do to stop it. He was in control of his life. He had the power to decide when he would and when he would not. Koho Zenji, the master who trained me, was paralyzed, blind, and deaf before he decided it was time to go. And two or three days before, he said, I am blind and paralyzed, he said this to me. I am now going deaf. I really will not be able to control this temple any longer when I am deaf, for I have no means of communication. Two days after he went deaf, he died. That I call being in charge of your life and not having a third party or a doctor decide it for you. You are in charge. That is one of the things all the patriarchs, all the ancestors have proved that this is possible. And I have seen it happen. So one of the big reasons for doing this is to be in charge of you. And if meditation is done properly, you very much are in charge of you. There is no way another person can force his or her influence upon you. You are an independent being who knows the third position, the eternal. Now, if you want to officially become a Buddhist, there are two ways it can be done. One is, of course, as a child. No child is ever forced to be a Buddhist. It is brought as a baby, can be, or it can come of its own will if the parents are in agreement, but it must never go contrary to the parents' wishes in this. It can be brought to the temple, and it is offered on the altar over the incense with the words, we offer this child to the Buddhas and ancestors so that they may guard and protect it until it comes to Buddhahood, he or she comes to Buddhahood. And then the child is handed back to the parents and nothing more happens. Simply a blessing is called upon it that it will be guarded and protected until it comes to Buddhahood, which, is, which means to become one with the third position. It can come to the equivalent of Buddhist Sunday school, which is simply a place where, for a few minutes, everyone will sit still and quiet. And it usually plays around a bit, sort of tests out what can it do. Can it sort of distract people? And they don't let it happen. And then it will eventually sort of, oh, they're staring at the wall, what's so interesting in the wall? and it will start looking at the wall. It's done solely by example. I've had dogs and cats sit and look at the wall, and they meditate really well, <laughs> simply because I was doing it, so there had to be something interesting in the wall, and then they did it. It's, uh, it's, very much the, it's taught very much in the same way. There's a quote I come up with from my youth in England during the war, when I bent down to tie a shoelace and 50 formed a queue behind me thinking there was going to be bread or something. But you see, if you do sit and look at a wall, somebody's going to say, he's got something. What's in that wall? And sheer greed is going to get him looking at the wall, which is fine. That's a positive use of greed. There's nothing wrong with using greed that way. And this is how you teach a child to meditate. You just teach them by you're doing it, so they want to do it. They discover how much more pleasant it is to be in that lovely, still place, and they join in. And then the rest of the Sunday school is just maybe playing a game or two, maybe even having a baseball game, just being still for a little. And there is something else they can do at the great festivals. And this, again, comes out directly from the Buddha's own teaching. Because it is said that when the Buddha entered his father's kingdom, all the princes and princesses came out in their best clothes, carrying lotus blossoms. 
to take him to the place where he was to teach. And at all the great festivals, the children, if they so wish, can become the princes and princesses of the Lord. They're known as the children of the king in the Far East. And they dress very beautifully and wear lotus crowns on their heads and carry lotus blossoms and walk in the processions with the monks. They can keep this up until they feel they're too big to do it or until 16, if they so wish. And obviously, sometimes a boy one year says, I don't want to do that, I feel it's too big, well, that's fine. If he's changed his mind the following year, he can still come and do it. There's no, nothing is going to be uh, held against someone for doing it not doing it. And when they are 16, they can do what is called Jukai, which is the time of taking the Ten Precepts, the great retreat for taking the Ten Precepts, which is the equivalent of becoming an adult Buddhist and saying, I wish to be an adult Buddhist. Uh, most adults do this if they have not been children of the king in their youth, and most Westerners, let's face it, haven't had that opportunity, although we've got quite a few up in Shasta that are doing it by that system. There are a number of ceremonies for Jukai. Five in all. You come to the temple for a week to live as the monks live. It is the duty of the monks to show you heaven, to show you what will happen as a result of this training, to show you what comes of keeping the precepts and the recognition of the Buddhas for keeping those precepts. It is their duty to also show you how throughout life millions of opportunities will appear. Is that a baby? Yeah. Okay. Millions of opportunities will appear and how to recognize them. And all of these things are shown in actual ceremonial. But before any of it can be shown to you, you have to agree that what you really want to do is to return to the third position and that you are willing to keep the precepts, or at least try for the days that you are here, and to know that there will be long arid times when nothing much seems to happen. So after the first night of arrival, you settle down to doing a full day of meditation, retreating into the meditative state. And remember, retreat in this sense really means we retreat in order to advance. We leave behind the world so that we may go forward. They spend a full day in meditation, having arrived the previous night. And when it grows dark, they are asked if they wish to take the precepts. They go to the main guest room of the temple, and there the master will arrive and read the precepts to them after being asked to do so by one of the monks. These worthy people wish to hear the precepts. Will you please read them to them? And the answer is, yes, I will. And when they have been read, remember you're not in the ceremony hall or in the meditation hall. You're just in the guest hall. You're thinking about whether or not you want to do this. There is no point in your seeing the beauty of heaven if you do not really wish to get to heaven. After the precepts are read, you are asked, do you wish to keep these precepts? And the congregation answers yes. Only after that yes has been given, given can the 
ceremony proceeds. The next, from then on, for another 24, maybe 48 hours, there is nothing but meditation and, of course, the meals and morning and evening service. It is essential that people know it is not going to be easy, that everything is not shown to them immediately. Each day of that session, each day of that retreat, is often said to represent 20 years of life for the average congregation member with how much they may do in the world outside. And then comes the second of the ceremonies. Although it may seem dark and nothing may seem to be happening, you still truly want to do it. So a person then decides that he wishes to do what perhaps is the best way of describing officially becoming a Buddhist. He does lay ordination. He has the abbot ordain him as a lay Buddhist. And this means that he agrees that he really, truly wishes to train much harder than the average layman wishes to. He is taking it so seriously that he wants to be a monk next time around. He really wants to clean up his karma. And a full ordination ceremony is done. Now, of course, when someone dies, a funeral ceremony in a Buddhist temple is an ordination ceremony. A lot of people wait until they're dead before they get ordained to come back and do it right. These people are saying, before I'm dead, I'm going to learn how it's done so that I don't make the mistakes later on. And so the ordination ceremony is done. Another full day may go by, or even two. Some people make this set of ceremonies last three months. The point is, to get it over to the congregation, that it's not going to be quick and easy. They're going to have to work at this. Then, when it is dark one night, comes the great ceremony of what I can best describe as recognizing what is within oneself, the things that one has done, recollecting one's past, really truly wanting to do something about it, to change from where one is to something different. Confession is not the right word. Contrition is not the right word. I'll be certain I'll never do it again is not quite the right word. If you get something that's mixed in to that collection, you've got an idea on what it is you're doing. Utter contrition is not quite the right word. At all events, there is a great procession. In the Far East, everyone goes barefoot and in rags. If we tried to do that up in Shasta, probably half the congregation would die of cold. I'm not sure. But at all events, in the Far East, that is what takes place. The three, three priests, usually the abbot and two senior priests, are the celebrants for this ceremony. And one of them represents the compassion aspect of the Buddha, Avalokiteshvara, Tanzeon. One represents, again, the love aspect. And one represents the third position, the eternal. And what you are effectively doing in this ceremony is walking through what you're going to have to do if you really want to clean up the purpose. You're going to have to have compassion for yourself. 
and know that the Eternal has compassion for you, or the third position. You are going to have to have love, both for yourself and other people. Too many people do not love themselves. You are going to have to know that when you go through compassion and love, you can truly know the eternal. So the procession starts, and you come to a small shrine, behind which sits the priest representing Avalokiteshvara, compassion. And this person will give you, out of a begging bowl, a small piece of paper which speaks of all the past things that you wish you hadn't done, that you are now utterly renouncing. The person carries this to the next small shrine, after a long and tedious wandering around of passages, which represents how you find out in the world all the things you wish you hadn't done, but don't know how to deal with, and then one day, there is love appearing, which gets rid of it all for you. You hand the piece of paper to this person, put it in his begging bowl, he's holding it like this, and he accepts it. And you go on wandering and wandering. Now you are trying to do the right thing, but still it may take many years. And then you come to a third shrine, and there suddenly is the representative of the third position, the eternal, which confirms that you did the right thing. From there, everyone goes to sit in the ceremony hall, which is absolutely dark. None of its beauty must be seen. The three priests come in, sit down, and a cauldron is brought. And all of the pieces of paper are put into the cauldron and burned up. Then the three priests utter a great cry, which is a cry of joy, and to get rid of any karma that might be kicking around that decided you didn't want to be burned. And then they leave the room. So the second great, the third great ceremony is simply a walkthrough of what happens in life. How suddenly you realize you need to have compassion on yourself. Suddenly you realize you have to love yourself and your fellow men that you've got to stop hating. I can remember the moment when that one actually happened to me in my own lifetime. It was out in uh, Japan, in my own temple. And I looked at the statue one day and said, I'm not going to go on doing this. I don't like me. Wow, that was so much better. But this shows you that you've got to do this if you would get rid of the cursor. And then the third one, when one day you have a realization the third position really does exist, it always did, and had nothing against it. And then the realization that all three of them are working together to get rid of the cancer. So Buddhist ceremonies, as I said, are walkthroughs of what you've actually got to do. And they're all geared for teaching the congregation and the monks what you've got to do. The details may be slightly different for everybody, but the main events are identical. The congregation after this goes back and waits and waits and meditates and meditates. Maybe another two, three days, maybe another week. It could be 20, 10, 20, 15 years, who knows, before the next realization comes. We are trying to represent it within a week. But it may take much more than that. Or if you understand that that is what we are looking for, you know that these will be the milestones in your life after the ten precepts retreat is over. These great moments will come. And by having walked through them, you will be able to recognize them when they come in reality. And this is the purpose of due time. To be able to recognize the reality and to want the reality. 
The next ceremony starts with the chief one of the three celebrants from the previous ceremony just wandering around and people join in the procession behind him. Because you never know when you will see the truth in front of you. And when you see the truth, it is important that you follow it. You never know where it will start from. It might start from the toilet, or it might start from the abbot's house, or it might start from a cellar. Who knows where the truth will be seen first? Know that it can be seen anywhere. And everyone walks behind, and the monk just walks along carrying his begging bowl and his staff. He is nothing special. He does not look like some wonderful guru. He is dressed in the simplest of all monk robes. He is not going around in gold and glory. He's just a simple monk. For the truth is a simple thing. And when the truth is seen, it must be understood that it will be seen simply. One of the beauties of one of the monks I have up in Shasta, who found the third position, was that when he did find it, it didn't occur to him that he should talk about it specially, because it seemed so right. That's the way to go. It is the natural place to be one with the third position. It is the natural thing to be one with the eternal. What we are up to is the unnatural thing. We are playing with the unreal and thinking it the real. The truth is a very simple thing when we find it. So the procession wanders, maybe round the ground, maybe just in the uh, ceremony hall, which is now somewhat brighter. You can begin to see things. You know. And the priest will walk back and forth between all of the uh, seats in the ceremony hall simply because he wishes to make it clear that all those who sat there before are still walking in the same procession. All those from before, all those who will come after, all the previous ancestors, they will all be in this one procession. Do not think that anyone is left out because they are dead or because they are no longer there. The congregation follow him, as do the monks. They sit down on their seats, and the abbot walks straight on to the main altar and ascends the main altar. Now, the main altar in a Buddhist temple is built in layers like this. I'm a very bad artist. You must forgive me. Same thing at the other side. So it's like steps, and each one of these is a sort of step up. But what it represents is Mount Sumeru, which is impossible to climb without the help of the Eternal, without the help of the third position. So you see, you can climb this bit, then how do you get from there? How do you climb up such a mountain? So there you have Mount Sumeru upon which sits the eternal, the third position, to rise upon Mount Sumeru, to climb the impossible mountain, to be one with that which is. The abbot climbs it, there's a staircase placed in front of the altar, so that every member of the congregation, through faith, can come to the Buddha upon the altar, to the third position, and receive the proof of their ability to do it. See, I told you, you don't show them all the horrors. You show them you can do it and how beautiful it is when you get there, which is just as important for, so, for keeping people in a happy society as trying to keep them down with fear. In fact, I think it works a lot better. Each person comes to the priest upon the altar. He or she is given a certificate proving that their name has been added to the list of ancestors. 
so long as we keep the precepts. They are one of the future Buddhas. There is a guarantee that as long as the precepts are kept, they themselves are the Buddha that is to come. And there comes a time in one's training when this becomes very, very clear that this is true. If you keep the precepts absolutely, there comes a moment when you know the Buddhahood is yours if the training continues. For the precepts themselves, as Dogen says in the Shishogi, are this very Buddhahood. Now, remembering what we talked about yesterday, uh, with regard to this, I want to make some more tie-ins with the Four Noble Truths upon which we only just touched. The first one is that suffering exists. That we know for certain. It exists. Now, when you know, in the Buddhist way, that suffering exists. You also know that the klesa exists. So to understand that suffering exists is also to understand that you have klesa vasana. When you know what has caused the Klesa Vasana, when you know the basic cause of it, you have discovered the second noble truth, which is suffering's cause. When you have discovered, either by both by means of mudras and meditation, how to get that Klesa Vasana cleaned up, then you have discovered the end of suffering once it is cleaned up. And if you then follow the eightfold path, the eight steps of that path, then you know how to always be able to touch base, as it were, or heaven, whichever way you like to look at it, with the third position. So the four noble truths have a direct tie-in with what you have here. And it is these four stages here, birth and death and the discovery of the Klesa, the cleaning up of the Klesa, the finding of the cause of the Klesa, and the Eightfold Path, it is that those very four steps that are talked of in the analytical manner used in Theravada as the Eightfold Path, and also those four steps that lead directly to Nirvana which is, of course, identical with the third position. Now, very few people normally equate those four noble truths with the going from birth to nirvana for the simple reason that they think of them as the four things that the Buddha himself discovered all in a bunch one night. It is, to my mind, conceivably possible that it all happened in one night. But we know that he sat under the bow tree for seven full days, at least, and it is very possible that he did it for a lot longer than that. Like all stories, 
of great religious leaders, there is a lot left out and a lot compressed. I personally would say that it took probably somewhat longer than one night for the discovery of the Four Noble Truths. I equally believe that on the final night, he definitely got the final one. But I think he took a little time in between getting the other three. I am not, having seen what I've, I have seen personally, with people who have gone all the way pretty well, with people who have gone all the way, at least as far as the end of the third of, the, of these, Having seen this, and knowing how long it took in between each one, and knowing the toll that it can take if you do it very fast, physically and spiritually, knowing that toll, I do wonder if all four of them happened on one night. But of course, it all took place 2,500 years ago, and this is going to be pure speculation if I tried to deal with that. However, you should know that they do correspond with these four, and that, from what I've seen of the average person, it takes between 5 and 30 years to go from 1 to 3. Now, I do not doubt, and the history of Buddhism makes it very clear, that a lot of people, a lot, I better qualify that, some people, the Buddhist saints definitely, did it fairly fast. But it's no good saying, well, they were the saints and I'm not that way, so what's the good of me doing it? It's no good saying, coming up with that sort of comment, the fact that a Buddhist saint seemed to do it overnight simply means that he'd either done his training elsewhere, which is the most likely thing, or he'd been so much conditioned by the world that a lot of things had happened that he didn't actually notice very much. You have to remember, I'm thinking here specifically of Hui Neng, the sixth patriarch, the sixth Chinese patriarch, who was a rice cook in the temple for two years and had already reached the third stage of discovering the end of suffering, the third noble truth. And he wasn't even ordained. And I'm sure most of you know the story of how the abbot made him the successor, the next ancestor, and told him to get out of the temple because the monks would half kill him with jealousy. And he fled, and the monks chased him and demanded the robe and bowl back because they wanted the job of abbot for themselves. And he was wandering in the forest for 15 years before they finally accepted him. And then before they let him become abbot, they insisted that he be, he be ordained. Well, of course, bigotry is not peculiar to any one religion. It never has been. Nor is it peculiar to any one bunch of monks. However, the fact remains that here we have someone who have made it all the way to the third stage in two years. But who knows what he'd been up to in the previous 15 years of his life? Who knows what his conditioning was? And often you will have people in a monastery who will seem, although they've only just got in, to be far more advanced than those who've stayed there 20, 30 years. And this is solely as a result of conditioning. Either in the life prior to their coming to the actual monastery, or maybe as a result of uh, how much cleser they picked up, perhaps they didn't get as much as others. Who knows the answer to that? However, it is always a little worrying to abbots, including myself, when you have someone who becomes very competent 
and has a lot of understanding very early on in their training, <coughs> in their training for the very simple reason that if they do that, they tend to miss a lot of quite important stuff that happens on the way. And it's somewhat difficult for them to go back. This is the argument, of course, that has always been raised between Soto and Rinzai. Rinzai accuses Soto of being slow and plodding, and Soto accuses Rinzai of being non unthorough. All you want is sort of a quick high, to put it into the vernacular, and do none of the real hard work of cleaning up the cluster. And says Soto, and all, and says Rinzai, all you want to do is keep your people down and keep on making them plod. The truth lies somewhere between the two. The one beauty of Soto, which is the reason I personally chose it, was that the teachers are not bound by any one specific method of teaching. Even Rinzai has to admit that. They are not bound by a specific method, not the uh, Rinzai, for example, always uses the method that was promulgated by Daiye Soko in, he, see, he died in 1089. Now, his, which is the Koan system, which I'm sure a lot of you who know about and have read books of Koans, his system is the one and only system used in Rinzai. There is nothing wrong with it as a system, but it works somewhat better for some people than it does for others. I'm sure you all agree with me that no one teaching method is going to be suitable for every single person. However, the Rinzai method is excellent for people who have a lot of jabbering in their heads, who are really noisy in their heads, who really cannot sit still uh, mentally for any length of time, and who can stand stress at very high abnormal levels. For them, it is absolutely the cat's whisker. It's perfect. But for someone who is likely to get high blood pressure as a result of a lot of tension, or who does not have very much noise going on in his head, it's extraordinarily unsuitable. One of the beauties of Sorgiji when I was there was that this was clearly understood by the abbot. And what he would do if he found he got someone who really couldn't sit still mentally, he would ring up the abbot of Myo Shinji in Kyoto, and say, I think I've got someone who will be better with you. And frequently the abbot would, there would ring for Hozenji up and say, I think I've got someone who might do better in your temple. And this was one of the great beauties of Rinzai and Soto when I was in the Far East. Their interest was in people finding the third position. It was not in counting numbers, not in counting how many were in the temple. Now, this isn't true of all abbots from what I hear, but at least with the two that were there when I was there, it was true, and it was beautiful. One of the people who was uh, helped to teach me, who was the... Uh, one of the presenter's assistants in the meditation hall had been in Myo Shinji and had been sent up to Sojiji because he really was not suitable for the Rinzai system. He tended to get too excited by it. That is another one of its dangers. 
because of the amount of use of the cure sack or the, the awakening stick, people who are overexcitable, if they think that a certain trainee isn't working as hard as he might be, tend to beat that trainee much too much just so as to get him going, to bring the tension up. And of course, you can kill people doing that. And this particular young man was just much too excitable to be into Rinzai. Fortunately, Rinzai also has a system which says that you can't be doing that sort of thing with the use of the cure sack. You cannot use the cure sack, in other words, unless you've actually been in the temple over 10 years. They had had this young man 10 years, and they expected him to calm down, but he didn't. He got worse. So the answer was, send him off to where he can be calmed down again. And so he was sent to Sorgigi. And those who were capable of handling it the other way went after Nyoshinji, which meant you didn't have square pegs and round holes. And that was quite a joy. Now, if you are in Soto, you'll have a different system. But the end result is identically the same. For people, as I said, who do not have a lot of noise in their heads, Soto is absolutely excellent. Except that it can turn you into what Koho Zenji occasionally calls a drowsy cow. That was the one thing you did not want to hear in the Zendo. Him walk up behind you and say, I don't like drowsy cows in my meditation hall. Meaning that the person's brain was so calm and quiet, it was just sitting there like a lump. You are not supposed to just sit and lump in the meditation hall any more than you are supposed to rush around in your skull in it. You're supposed to be doing something. You're at least supposed to be visually alive, if you, if you know what I mean. So, the beauty of Soto for me was the fact that you were not stuck with any one system. 